Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Sherry Huss. Sherry is the co-founder of Maker Fair, an innovator in residence at Freeman. Sherry is all about creating experiences, connecting community, building tribes, and having a bit of fun while she's at it. Her latest projects include the Cameron Row Maker Music Festival and Live Team. Uh, that that Maker Music Festival was so much fun, Sherry. Um, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. It's nice to be here with both of you today. Yeah, we're really looking forward to some of your cool tool suggestions. Nice. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. Yeah, you, you, I have a feeling you know more like makers than anyone on the planet, probably. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Actually, it was kind of fun picking up lots of new makers from all around the world for Maker Music Festival. So, yeah, it's, it's really great. It's so cool. And it got me actually interested in um, electronic music. And I've been, downloading different synthesizer packages for Arduino and and working on like little synthesizer projects. Nice. It's been so much fun. And, and I want nice. to talk to Joe about that too uh, when I have a chance, your, your partner who will be on a episode very soon. Great. Um, yeah, let's talk about uh, your tools. And well, first of all, first one is a writing implement. Yep. Um, I have to say, this is my favorite tool. I use it every day. It's the Rotring 600 fountain pen. And what is so great about it, I love fountain pens. And this past year, I found that I actually pulled out more, more stationery and more cards and did a lot more handwritten notes. And I always go to this one pen. Uh, it's, it's heavy. It feels like a tool. It feels like I'm picking up, oh, like a, a, you know, a screwdriver or something when I go to write. And mm -hmm. I, just, I just start there. And I love purple ink in it too. That's my other little. And it's thing. called a silver pen. Is it actually made out of silver? No, Is that it's, why it's heavy. Um, um, no, it's not made out of silver. You know, it's it's actually interesting. Back in the day of my first events, like Java One, we bought these and um, branded them with ZD Studios and kind of gave them away as they were kind of tools. We always felt, but it's just the color silver, and it's made by the German company Rotring. And the interesting thing is, um, for some reason, it looks like they've taken them off the market, but there's enough that you can find through mm -hmm. eBay. And I would say, go for it because, and I'm glad I've actually hoarded a couple extra ones. I didn't realize until I was pulling this together that it was taken off the market. But Wow, that's too bad. It, they're, they're really cool looking. Yeah, they're, and they were on the market for years. So there's enough of them in circulation and a lot of them were given as gifts. I highly recommend if you like fountain pens and I have all the other fancy ones. But this one is no nonsense. It just, it feels good. It's hexagon shape, so it fits in your hand. You can kind of roll it around. And it just feels like you're, you're getting down to business when you're using it. So yeah, I love it. It does. And it, uh, it, it looks a little bit like the Rotring mechanical pencils, too. It, it is, only it's heavier. Like the pencil's really nice as well. It's a lot thinner. This mm -hmm. one is really, there's a heft to it that you just, um, it just feels good. Very tactical. And I'm looking, it's it's in the neighborhood of like 350 bucks. It is. Is that about right? I think that's right. But you know, when I bought these, like, I mean, this this was like a, this really was like a pen under a, like $100. It was like in the $75 to $100 oh, wow. range. So it's so become a collector's people item. Are, it's kind of becoming a bit of a collector's item. But I bet you can still find them out there. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, um, they're worth looking for. If you're a mechanical or a fountain pen person. This is this is mm -hmm. your like utilitarian functional everyday one. And, and, and when you say fountain pen, does it work with a cartridge, or is it kind of like the old fashioned that you need to um, vacuum up, suck up the ink, or how does how does we fill? Yes it and yes. So it, it will take cartridges, but I use the um, I actually buy Waterman ink. I like Waterman purple, mm -hmm. and I um, it's got like a little siphon that that um, that you kind of screw out and it sort of sucks it up, and then you mm -hmm. just put it into your pen. So okay. it's. It's the way to go. That's cool. And so, um, in the you you've supplied some pictures, and it, it, that little card is that's 
is that just a blank card that you write with or that is kind of orange and red? Oh, you know what that is? That's actually, I was doing a, um, for one of the maker music festival folks, it was his birthday and I was Ah. sending him stickers. That's a Rothko print. Um, it's kind of orange and red. And I was, I had pulled that out yesterday. And so when I took a picture, I just, um, put it there. Cool. That's a good one. Okay. So the, the Rotring 600 fountain pen, and uh, you can look for it on eBay or uh, elsewhere. And uh, yeah, this is a good one. It's crazy that they don't make it anymore. I know. I, I know. I want to find what, what the story is about that. Yeah. So the next one is a, uh, a baking implement. It is. It is a French rolling pin. And it's just a common French rolling pin. In fact, my grandmother gave it to me. When I was, I think when I was like leaving for college, you know, it was one of those kind of rites of passage and she was always Mm -hmm. a baker and I always would watch her bake. And I thought, this is strange, like, but okay, I've carried it around all these years and it's a simple, I mean, I think it's, it's made out of a hardwood. I think it's beechwood. Um, In fact, when I went to look to source it now, they're all getting really fancy, but this one is, you know, it seems like you can pick one up for anywhere from like 13 to 25, $30, depending on what type of wood you get, but it's, it's so simple and elegant and it doesn't have the handles. It's one long tapered piece of wood. And it really, there's just something very special about it. When you're rolling out dough, it gives you more control. Um, you can kind of, you know, control the thickness and I don't know, it's just my go-to tool in the kitchen. And my funny story is I couldn't find it like um, several months ago. And Joe was awfully quiet. Joe, who's my husband, and it's like, where could that rolling pin have gone? And then he said, well, you know, actually, when one of the guys, when we went to Mexico, we were doing tortillas and that, and I just put it in my bag. And so for like a couple of months, we thought he left it down there, but actually oh, it, was, it was hidden in the back of the drawer. And oh, at that gosh. time, I had to like go look at sourcing new ones, but it's just one of those special things and it was given to me by my grandmother. So made it even more special. I guess if you're a maker, you could make one of these pretty simply because it is just kind of a long dowel with tapered ends. Absolutely. But, you know, it's like it's amazing how we get attached to things, which is probably Mm -hmm. why you have the Cool Tools podcast. It's just it was crazy that I was so attached to it because it's just a piece of wood. Like, you know, it's not a fancy piece of wood, um, but you kind of get used to the same thing with the pen. You sort of get used to the feel and the shape and. But you're absolutely yeah. right. It would be and, a great, a great gift and something. I imagine as people got into baking this past year, more people are um, sourcing rolling pins like this. Yeah, it's interesting. I find I found that like giving cooking things as gifts to people, they really remember them, and they remember mm-hmm. the person who gave it to them. Like I carve wooden spoons and give them to people for gifts. Oh, and nice. years later, they'll say, I still use that spoon you gave me. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It is. Yeah, that's that's really sweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like this, th- you have an attachment to your grandmother from this one. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. How many mm-hmm. years ago did she give it to you? Oh, my gosh, Mark. You know, I am 63 now, and I was probably like 18 in that photo. So I've carried that, <laughs> that rolling pin around with wow. me for a long time. That is so yeah. cool. Yeah. And it's just, it's so, it's, that's beautiful. And you also testify that it, that it's easier to use or you have more control than the kind of no, you know, kind of traditional looking rolling pin that has a axle, I guess you would say. Exactly. Handles. Like with the handles. Absolutely. Cause yeah. you find your center of balance. What happens is you sort of, you kind of push your body into it in the middle and it's sort of tapered down at the end. And it's really, it's elegant and simple, but I think folks that start using the French rolling pin. And again, it's so interesting because there was nothing very fancy about my grandmother at all. But for some reason, someone must have, I kind of wish I knew the story, like how she even got turned on to that. So your mom, your, your grandma wasn't French. It was just that no, she had no. this. I see, I see. Okay. No, not at all. In fact, she was Eastern European and came over to the U.S. when she was a teenager. So not at all. But she made the best poppy seed rolls and nut rolls. And I still try to emulate them today with that uh-huh. rolling pin. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure we'll find a source for it. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, there are, there's a lot. There's, included a link. there's a lot there. Like, actually, it's, it's kind of amazing now. There's almost probably too many styles. Like, they've gotten really fancy and everything from Food 52 to Amazon. There's 
no shortage of of options to select from. Okay, great. That sounds good. So uh, t- tell us about your next tool, Sherry. Well, my next tool is something um, that I actually used a lot during Maker Faire days. It's, um, it's a box set of Brian Eno's cards, um, <laughs> Oblique Strategies. And, mm-hmm. you know, there would be several times when it's like, oh, my gosh, how are we going to do this? Or you've just spent so much time working on a problem. And the great thing about these cards, I mean, I think that they're, they're um, advertised as like creativity unblockers, and they truly are. So you pull a card from the deck and just, you know, it gets you out of the space that you're in and kind of gives you another dimension to think about something. And I love them. I've given them as gifts. You can find them on, again, this is another eBay purchase. I mean, there's some of the original sets that are crazy expensive, but you can pick up a, one of these decks for about $100, $125. There's usually a couple that are whenever I go to look in circulation, but they're so much fun. And there's also an app which works when you don't have your deck with you. And, um, you know, I think it's a couple dollars to get the app and I, I definitely have it and it's just fun as well. But, you know, the, the cards are just, you know, I actually love, even when I was taking a picture, there was one in there that I pulled, which was try faking it. And that was, um, that was given by Stuart brand to, um, <laughs> to, to, you know, and his partner when they were doing oh, the deck. Cool. So <laughs> That's good. Do the cards have who who uh, gave no. the suggestion? No, no, no. no. That oh. one did. So that was a special. That was you know when I actually took picture. Of, like I hadn't noticed that one. I hadn't pulled that one before. So yeah. it's um it's a it's totally special. Most of them came from either Peter or Brian themselves in their studio as they were trying to um, write songs. Yeah, and they really, I mean, I have to say they work. I can, like, again, with Maker Fair, it's like, okay, we need to get that parking lot from the neighbor plate. How are we going to do it? You know, like, we'd be sitting in a hotel room, and it's just like, I would travel with the deck, and it's like, we pull it out, <laughs> and it's like, okay, here we go. Yes, so, I love that. They're, they're Maker- fun. They're totally fun. Yeah. That's that's so cool that, like, <laughs> Maker Fair, <laughs> like, was successful in part because you were able to use oblique strategies to get you out of a stuck situation. And trust me, there were a lot of stucks. Oh my (laughs) God, Jerry, I cannot believe how you were able to pull that off. I know. I know. So oblique strategies were certainly, they were certainly um, a little, a little secret there that helped us. That's (laughs) that's amazing. (laughs) I love that. Um, Okay. So uh, tell us about discord. So Discord, you know, and this actually goes back to Maker Faire too. So Discord is an online community and it grew out of the gaming community. Um, a little known fact is most gamers spend 75% of their time chatting and 25% of their time gaming. So the cool mm-hmm. thing about Discord is, is that it's, um, you know, it's an online community that lets you, or a platform that actually lets you go back and forth kind of seamlessly between chat and or video and or um, voice. But it actually has a really fun interface. And this goes back to Maker Faire too. Phil Tyrone years ago, Phil and Lamore of Adafruit, mm-hmm. Phil's like, Sherry, it's Discord. And I'm like, I don't get this Discord. What is it? He's like, no, no, it's Discord. And I have to say, once again, and Mark, you and I worked with Phil back at Make. Um, mm-hmm. He has like a you know a sixth sense for these things. But yeah. It's really, it's, it's amazing. I'm currently running three communities on Discord now, two for Maker Music Festival, um, one for fans and one for makers, and then one for Live Team, which is another project that I've started. And I'm in eight communities. And what's cool about Discord? Number one, you, it's free. So it's really easy to set up and spin up a server. It has a, it has a fun interface. So you can actually go back and forth between all your different Discord groups pretty seamlessly, and you can see who's online. You can jump into a conversation, and I'm learning it as I go, too. I mean, I kind of feel that that's part of the fun is learning something, too. Yeah. But but I do say, if you haven't used it, I recommend it, and they keep adding lots of cool, like, bots, and I'm just, like, a fraction of, um, even though I'm setting up and moderating a few channels um, on their server there, there's just so many tools that they keep building and adding to. And I have to say it's, it's pretty cool. 
And do you use mostly uh, it via text? Do you use the audio any? And do you use it more from your phone or from your desktop? Um, you know, I do both phone and desktop. I find desktop gives me a better sense of who's on, but but the phone works really easy. Um, mostly text, but I, I have been getting into voice. And I'm just about ready to start with video um, as well. So, but it works really well. And, you know, I know Phil, I think Phil's community now, Adafruit's like over 20,000 people on it. You can set up moderators really easily. Um, you can give people all sorts of power. Um, it's free. They do have a, a pack that's like $99 a year. And I did upgrade to that, but it gives you a few more things, which again, I don't even know what all those are yet. Yeah, but it's okay. it's free. It's good. It's cool. And what kind of tools do the moderators have? Well, the moderators can do everything from they can they can shut you down, they can zap you, they can um, embed links, they can set up various um, channels. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they can start. They can spin up new channels. Um, so it's actually pretty cool, and you can you yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. It's so, yep. My, uh, my 18 year old daughter, Jane is a gamer and she's on a bunch of discords all the time, constantly on. And so she set up a family discord for us that we use because I have one one of my daughters lives out of state now. So we're on that all the time. I have used, uh, Joshua Schachter has wheelhouse, Adafruit. It it really kind of like, it's different from Slack, but it's, also, I think could replace Slack. It blows it out of the water in, in a lot of different ways. Yeah. You know, I think the smoothness of it, the, the ease of use, all the tools available, and the fact that it's free, it's crazy. Is it's there, just, are there things that, it, um, that Slack does that, it, that Discord cannot do? I haven't I come across anything. I don't that, think so. I don't think so. I mean, someone had said, like, basically, Discord is sort of a more elegant Slack and kind of Reddit combined. And mm-hmm. I actually think there's lots of Reddit groups now on Discord. It it's really it's it's worth checking out. I think they have 250 million users, and I know Microsoft recently tried to buy them for like 10 billion dollars, and they they, they said, said no. no. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a cool. It's it's actually like I'm I'm a little surprised that I like it so much, especially since it took me a while to get my head around what it was. Mm-hmm. But it's it's good. Yeah. And do do you actually use Slack for other projects? You know, I've uh, yes, but I actually not I've, I've never really liked Slack. I don't know why. Like it it seems to there's something about it. It seems to like I don't know, corporate or officey. Like this seems fun. And I I can't explain it. Does it seem but fun. it's just more it is more fun. And even the interface is just easier to use. But it's almost like you're going from room to room too. It like the movement movement is a lot easier. Like well, Slack is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Is moving between channels on Discord is a lot easier than moving between channels in Slack. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes it's too easy because it's like, wait a minute, which one am I in? <laughs> I mean, am I, <laughs> yeah. am I doing this or am I doing that? Like, <laughs> but it, um, but it is. It, it, they seem to get the. Um, the people flow and how people want to communicate with each other. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, Discord, I, I recommend it. It's free. It's free to start a server. Um, a good way to start is with your friends or if you have a, a family and you're not all in the same, well, I mean, we're in the same house and the, and we use it just to talk to each other sometimes when we're in the same room. But uh, it's just a, a great way to like communicate uh, as a group with any small kind of micro community. And it makes me think like, why have Facebook and everything that all the negatives that Facebook has with it, when you can like have a community that you really like a kind of a micro community that you care about and you have all the advantages of Facebook and none of the disadvantages. Completely. I completely agree. So uh, tell us about this, this tote bag. It looks really nice. Gosh, I love this bag too. Uh, I don't know. I like bags and bowls, and but this one, I this I'm on my second one, and I bought this up in Portland. Um, it's a Chester Wallace tote bag. Although interesting that Chester and Wallace were the names of the grandfathers of the gentleman Patrick Long oh, who makes cool. these bags. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. But what's so great about it is it's a long bag. It's almost like a tool bag, but it's I I carry yeah. it everywhere. 
Uh, it works for men and women. Um, it folds over as well. So you don't have to worry about things falling out. There's mm-hmm. two pockets on the side. One has a flap over it that you can put your keys in. And the other one, I slip my, um, my iPhone in. And I, I do have that red strap, so you can kind of make it a little bit fun. Mm-hmm. It's like a, it's a wax canvas with a leather bottom, and it's just the design is perfect. There are a couple pockets inside. But for carrying things around, it's got it's long, it's deep, it takes, you know, you could put a computer in there if you want. And again, it, it travels well. So I highly recommend that. I think it's about $150, but it lasts. I mean, I'm on my second one, but I'm talking like over a period of about 10 years. So Wow. I'm I'm having a I I can't tell exactly how how big it is the scale of it. Oh gosh. Okay, so I would say the bottom is probably um like maybe 18 inches and it when mm-hmm. it's fully open it's probably close to 24. It's it's it's, it's big. Like mm-hmm. and when it folds over it's probably like 12 to 16 inches. So okay. it's a, it's a good it's a good size. So you have no trouble putting a, a uh, laptop in it of no, even a, uh, a larger no. size one. Nope. It's great. And I, again, it just is great that it folds over too, because I'm always worried about stuff falling out. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, the design is just, it's beautiful. And so this is something you don't, you, this is like a purse that you use. It, it is. I, mean, I use it every cool. day. Yes. But I've also seen like, again, I've seen men using it. And when mm-hmm. I was with Gerard, who's a friend of ours, Gerard's Paella, we mm-hmm. were at a um, checking out a ghost kitchen, and actually one of the drivers in there that was picking up food showed me his bag that he was wearing or that he was using. He goes, we have the same bag. They come in lots of colors, um, and you can get straps in lots of colors, so they're they're actually fun as well. But mostly it's, 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 a, it's a single – there's a pocket on the outside, but it's not divided inside. It's a single – No, it's, it's completely yeah. open inside, right. except mm-hmm. there, and there is a pocket, and there's uh, – one big pocket on the inside that's in the middle on the side. So it doesn't, but it's all open. It's kind of like a tool bag. You know, you open it up and you can kind of look in. Mm -hmm. There's no divider, which makes it perfect. That looks really great. You find cool stuff, Sherry, that like (laughs) really high quality, neat (laughs) stuff that, that people should know about. I love it. (laughs) Cool. Um, so tell us about what your what a recent project is that you're working on. Besides, yeah, yeah. And, and and yeah, I mean they're they're so cool, Cheryl. You've been doing these kind of during the pandemic these virtual events that I think I, I can imagine that they're going to become live now that we're past this. I hope, but yeah, tell us about like Decameron Row Maker Music. Sure, yeah, sure. So Decameron Row, and I, I know that you've had Itamar um, Kabovi on the show, who's one of yeah. five of us that worked on Decameron Row. Yeah, we have. Um, and that also Joe Such, who's my husband, Juan Diaz, Bohukras, um, and Stephanie Sobel also were part of Decameron Row. But that started as a passion project during when, like about a year ago, when we were saying, like, we're locked down. What would our Decameron be? And for those that don't know the Decameron, it's Giovanni's Boccaccio work from the 14th century during the, the big plague, the Black Plague, when 10 friends fled from Florence to the hills. And for 10 days, they told um, stories to each other. So 10 friends, 10 days, hundred stories. So we said, what would our, like, what would our friends, like what would their one minute um, video be of their time during lockdown? And so that got us um, into creating something called Decameron Row, which is pretty wonderful. It's an imaginary place, a street of eight buildings. There are windows in each building and there are hundred windows with a hundred tales of, lockdown stories. And that got us thinking about, um, again, this imaginary place and uh, places. And I know you'll be talking to Joe, but um, we did a maker music festival in Sebastopol in 2018. And this is for makers, people that make their own instruments or make their own sound or modify or hack a, a traditional instrument. We had about um, 25 makers. It was really quite wonderful and decided we wanted to do it again. And of course, 2019 came and we were going to do it in 2020 in the pandemic through some of the work on Decameron Row. And Joe kept saying, you know, you guys like think about the web, like you're designing for the web. We can actually go into the rooms. Um, 
we can think about this differently. So he started working on kind of redoing the back end of the Cameron Row. And in January of this year, he said, I want to do Maker Music Festival. And I said, okay. And he said, um, I'm like, when do you think you want to do it? And he said, like soon. So we, um, we in February, we pulled together a, a, a town hall. We had 26 makers and music makers. And we said, like, what do you think? And they said, yeah, we're all in. They told their friends. We got together in March um, and started working on it. We kind of goaled that we would like 100 projects. Anyway, in less than 100 days, we delivered something that's pretty amazing. It's makermusicfestival.com. We have, I think, over, I don't know, over 200 makers, over 300 projects, makers from all around the world, and um, 19 buildings. And these are like buildings that live in an imaginary campus, all named after pioneers and um, composers um, in kind of the music making space. The first building when you enter will be is named after Harry Parch. And the buildings contain, I think, anywhere from nine to 20 windows. And you click on a window and you go in and you get to experience um, that maker. So there's one area that's a video that we've set up. And then there's an area, a bio area. And then there's like a frequently asked questions from Maker Fair. We know that usually the people ask you the same questions. So we actually put that in there. There's an area with all their contacts. And it's just been wonderful. Um, like I said, we have makers from all over the world, which that would have never happened without the pandemic. And, and actually, even now we're, we're hearing that schools are like there was a group of makers that took school children around from um, from China and from the UK, and they're they're able to go and visit these makers and get inspired by what they're doing. And this campus lives on, so we will have another Maker Music Festival next year. But we're also going to pop up and do monthly and quarterly smaller events to keep things moving forward. So it's it's a, it's great. You developed a really great model for other kinds of virtual events because it's easy to wrap your head around this concept of buildings with windows. When you hover your cursor over a window, it starts to play a sample of the music that's produced by the instrument. Then you click on the window and you see the video of the instrument in action plus extra information about the person who made it and about the instrument itself. So it's just very intuitive. There's no like confusion. A lot of these kind of online events are a mess. And this is just very like su such a great intuitive model that um, it's got legs. And, you know, you did it kind of with the camera and you're doing it with this. So um, you've developed a great model here to, to, to replicate. No, it's fun. It's cool. And I think the, the most exciting thing for me is that we now have probably the largest um, network of music makers from around the world. And I can't wait till we start seeing live maker music festivals popping up and we can travel around and meet all these people because all of them share that same maker welcoming spirit. Like they're all so wonderful and each project is so great. And during that weekend, we did 20 hours of live programming as well, which we'll be putting up on YouTube. But it's just so amazing, you know, like we, we opened the festival in Italy with Porca Pizza, which is the gentleman that's, that's just wonderful. Like for half an hour, he was playing um, with his own unique Italian style um, instruments made out of found and reclaimed things. And we ended the festival in Kyoto, Japan with the robot band and, um, and their tatami business. Like they sell tatami mats and they have robot bands and instruments made out of tatami. So I have to say we truly like went global on this one and I'm, I'm excited and can't wait to um, kind of keep pushing it forward. And do you have another one scheduled? We do. It's going to be scheduled. Um, it's in next May. It's the third weekend in May. And I want to say it's the 14th and 15th of May, 2022. Okay. But we also are going to be, like I said, we'll be doing like maybe an hour performance every month and every quarter we'll do a couple hours Mm -hmm. And we were even on the phone today with a woman. Um, I don't know if you know the tool Jack Trip, but Jack Trip mm -hmm. came out of um, C of Stanford CC RMA, and it's it allows you to play instruments together uh, across the internet with no latency. So cool. she's going to actually be teaching. So she's going to pop up and do some things for makers in the community to get people ready to go. It's just such a you know. I mean, Mark, you know the maker community, and Kevin, you do too. It's like it's just 
such a giving community. It's so great to like represent them and give them a platform that really showcases their work and kind of gives them the, you know, again, the attention that they deserve. Yeah. Really cool. That's um, great. Um, Sherry, we just have a, a minute. Uh, tell us about uh, the other uh, thing, live team. I'm not sure. really familiar with what that is. Well, so live team. So, you know, the events of uh, the event space is also part of my world. So live team is I've been working with a large event company, a global company called Freeman. And over the past year, I'm their innovator in residence. And over the past year, I'm again, as a lot of folks lost their jobs, I was saying, why aren't we creating a community for people to come together? And like now more than ever, they have time, we can learn from each other, we can share and we can network. And so this is something that's for the events industry or anyone that wants to, to join it. Whether you have a job or don't have a job or want to change a job, we're coming together. We You register, which then we can actually use that to help companies that are looking for folks, looking for people. I do a weekly, a half an hour um, community meeting with the members once you're registered. And then I have set up the Discord channel where we can chat and learn and share. So it's a little bit experimental. I'm kind of taking the maker world into the corporate world, but I think it's going to, um, I think it's going to work. So, so um, the person who might want to join this would be a person who is looking to change your career or um, I'm not really sure. Um, so it it's actually, it's, so it's, it's pri primarily designed for people in the live events business. So you could have a job, but you know, the world has changed a lot over the past year and given all of the retraining and training around virtual and hybrid events, there's a lot that needs to be learned and shared quickly. Okay. So you um, say live events, meaning the people who put on conferences or, or concerts concert? or hospitality. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So, mm -hmm. And this is a way for them to meet each other. It's kind of like a networking tool. Um, it's networking. And I, like, our goals, like my really goal is to learn, share, and network. Right now, there's a lot of folks that are, um, that are out of jobs. So we're trying the first phase is kind of getting the talent placed. But if we had this network set up, as you can imagine, like when we went into the pandemic, how much stronger we would have been going through the this last year together. So it's really taking kind of that open source sharing community value into an event industry that's, you know, that that's actually not been focused around community and seeing what we can do. Competitor, it doesn't matter what company you're from or where, what your background is. And I'm actually even hoping to get students out of college that are interested in hospitality or events or production mm -hmm. and get them in there. So we're just starting off and it's, it's been a good forum. And I would imagine that uh, lots of kinds of things might transfer to the virtual space or some hybrid of it. And that would also might be part of the discussion. Exactly. We're sharing, we're sharing everything. I mean, this next week in our weekly session, um, the biggest event now that's happening is happening in Las Vegas next weekend. It's the world of concrete. It's normally <laughs> 60,000 people. It's now down to 30,000 people. Uh -huh. uh, Informa is the, um, is the organizer and they're not requiring masks. They're not, re they're, they're saying that they suggest them, but they're not required. There's no COVID testing or no proof of vaccination. So it's going to be, all eyes are going to be on that. What I'll do is I'll have someone from the live team audience or from my community that's going to be there report out to us in our weekly meeting. Cause we're all curious as to like, how is this working and what's happening? And, and anyway, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a community to share. And it's on discord. It is it's, it's on discord. So you register, you go to live team.com and you register. Once you're registered, I give you the weekly link to our meeting and then an invite to discord. Well, great. That's fantastic. That sounds great. Well, Sherry, thanks so much. This has been really great chatting with you, you, catching up with you. And, uh, so excited that uh, you're going to continue all of these events. And uh, I can't wait. Uh, if you do the Make, the Make a Music Festival live, I'm, I'm coming to it. Oh, yeah, we will. We will be doing that, too. So That sounds great. Well, thank you. And thanks, both of you. It's great. to be. It's an honor to be on Cool Tools. And I love what both of you do and glad, glad to help you in any way. So. Yeah. Likewise. It was a pure pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey everybody, it's your co-host Mark, and I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week. Music